Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Inspiring you to bring God back into the conversation of the day. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. So, do you remember Naomi? Naomi, um grew up in Judea um, and she married a boy named Boaz and they started a life together. And then there was a famine in the land. And so in order to survive the famine, um, they migrated to a neighboring country. They crossed an international border um, and they migrated as refugees to a foreign country. It was called Moab. And it was there that Naomi and her husband, oh, not Boaz, I'm making that up, Elimelech, i so sorry. Let me start over. Naomi was a girl in Judea, and she met a boy named Elimelech, and they got married, and there was a famine, and they left Judea and crossed an international border into a foreign country named Moab, where, you know, there was, there was enough food um, to, to feed themselves. And There, Naomi and Elimelech had sons, uh, Malon and Chilion, and Elimelech at some point along the way died. Um, And so Naomi is a widow, but she's got two boys, and her two boys, um, you know, grew up in Moab. And so, not surprisingly, they married, you know, girls they met there. And their names were Orpah and Ruth. Well, Naomi's sons died as well. Now, that's a story of grief, is it not? I mean, she's lost her homeland. She's migrated to a foreign country in order to survive. She's lost her husband. She's raised her boys there, and they've gotten married, but now she's lost her sons. And um, sometime after the death of her sons, she learned that, you know, back in Judah, there was bread again. There, you know, like the the wheat had returned, and there there was um, there was an opportunity to maybe move back, quote unquote, home. But she'd be moving home all by herself as as a widow um, and as a woman who had lost her sons. Um, so this is the status of a migrant widow in the Bible, and I bring this up today because. It is a story in the book of Ruth of restoration, and you should read it. It's a, Ruth is one of the shortest books of the Bible. I highly commend it to you today. Um, read the book of Ruth and get to know Naomi and get to know Ruth, and then eventually get to know Boaz, who I mentioned earlier, um, and he's definitely one of the primary characters, um, and I want you to read about him and his heart and the redemption that God provides through him. Boaz is a really good example of what it looks like to uh, be a godly person and receive the migrants that God sends um, and and to recognize that sometimes what God is doing it requires people crossing international boundaries in order to accomplish it. I don't know why that is, but it is. And so why bring all of this up today? Well, there's a lot of conversation in our culture and even amongst our uh, the political speech making of the day um, about migrants, about people who are immigrants and who people who cross international borders for all kinds of reasons. And there are hundreds of millions of people on the move around the world today. Um, and they are crossing international borders, including the international border at the southern edge of the United States. And so we can have this conversation um, in lots of ways, and we can have it from uh, recognizing that we are citizens of a nation that needs to have secure borders and we need to know who's crossing them, and we then also have this conversation as Christians 
who say, okay, we need to know who's crossing the border and absolutely we need to, um, you know, control that. But we also need to have a generosity of spirit for those who are fleeing persecution or famine um, in places around the world. So how do we show hospitality to those who are arriving on our shores? Um, how do we be how do we continue to be the nation of, of immigrants and uh, an opportunity and and hope for a future? That's why people are coming. Well, that's why most people are coming. Now, the people who are coming for naughty purposes, you know, right. I agree with you. We need to keep them out. Um, here's what, uh, here is what research is telling us. And I actually found this kind of illuminating. So Pew Research has issued a new study, um, that says that, uh, of, of immigrants around the world, um, there's a lot of people of faith. There's a lot of Christians. Uh, Christians make up about 30% of the world's population but about 47% of the world's immigrants, the people who are on the move, the migrants, the people who are, see, who are seeking for one reason or another to leave where they have been and move somewhere else. Now, that should tell us something. If 47% of the people who are on the move around the globe are Christians, then we're not just talking about uh, offering hospitality to strangers. We're talking about opening our proverbial doors to our brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm just going to let that settle in for a moment. I don't really have a whole lot more to say about it. I just want us to be thinking about that. If 30% of the general population around the world are Christians, but 47% of all migrants are Christians, then there's a higher percentage of Christians who, for one reason or another, are fleeing where they have lived and looking for, um, looking for a better life in another place. So as you are considering the conversations of the day, particularly the, conversation, the conversations about immigrants and, um, and refugees, and uh, I just think it would be helpful for us to remember that there are reasons that people move from one place to another, and God uses those stories in redemptive ways that we can't always anticipate in the moment. And so let us be Boaz in, in the story. And if you're not familiar with the story of Boaz, become familiar with it by reading the book of Ruth. Our friend Bill English is going to join us next. Oh yeah, we're going to talk about a really sexy topic. That is going to be inflation. Now, prices have gone up. This is no surprise to anybody. Prices are probably not, in most cases, going back down, which means that, um, those inflated prices are here to stay. Surprisingly, in the midst of all of that, not everything costs more, but some things cost a lot more. We'll talk about that next with our friend Bill English. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. Our friend Bill English is here from BibleAndBusiness.com. When you think about what costs more and what costs less, yeah, how's that ledger working out for you? Good morning, Bill. <laughs> not not so well for me. How about for you? <laughs> yeah, pretty much it feels like everything has gone up in price, although apparently there are a few things that cost less than they used to. But I'm not buying, I'm really probably not in the market for nor buying the things that cost less. Solar yeah, well, panels. The- like I'm not, I'm not buying, I'm not, I'm not buying solar panels. Things that, that are, um, that we have to have in society, Mm -hmm. Uh, even though we have choices between vendors, uh, those things that tend to be going up, right? So eggs are up. The necessity things, the, uh, the price of eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, auto insurance is going way up. And if, if you live in the happy state of Minnesota, where I live, um, then it's going, you know, Minnesota is expected to be one of the highest increases of car insurance nationwide over the next six to 12 months. So the cost of owning yeah. a car, like people think about, okay, so I could get a car. I can actually, you know, the, the price of used cars, that's actually something that has technically gone down. Um, so, oh, this is a good time to buy a used car, except that the cost of insurance uh, for that car has increased like almost 20%. So the cost of owning the car um, has gone way up. 
that is actually an interesting um, conversation to have. That so it's not it's not a question of whether or not I can afford to buy something. It is a question of whether or not I can afford to own something. Like those are different. Yes. Yeah, they are. Um, you know, I was talking with my, my, I'm sorry, my company is looking to lease a fleet of vehicles. Right now we rent from Enterprise and we're looking to lease a, a fleet of vehicles. And we're talking are with one gentleman. they all going to be like boring and white? Like, as I feel like a fleet of vehicles no. is like they're, they're all white and they look like grandma <laughs> cars. No? Okay, well, just check. Um, I've told them that I don't big care what giant make, mercury. Color. You know those. You know those giant. Like you know what I'm talking about. Like a big mercury. That's what I think of when I think of a fleet of cars. No. Okay. Boy, you're going back to the '70s on that one, <laughs> or the '80s, anyways. No, I live the in the point 80s, is Bill. is that this is my happy place. Point yeah. is, is that the uh, the guy at the auto dealership is telling me that they have way too many cars and trucks sitting on their lot. Mm. And they are, are instead of losing money to the finance companies to keep them on their lot because they have to pay interest on those on those oh, automobiles when they like sit on their me. lot. Huh. They're they're passing it along to the consumer and selling them at a loss right now. But you balance that with the cost of registration, licenses, you know, tabs, insurance, and stuff like that, and it's still a very expensive proposition to buy a new vehicle. I'm just now looking. Apparently, in May of 2024, Nissan told its dealers to start selling their 2024 models at a loss because they need to you yeah. move more units. Apparently, they're not. The, yeah, there's probably a lot of them out there. This just happened to be the one that pops up, um, uh, you know, on my on my Googler when I ask it the question. <clears throat> um, so prices are not going back down. I think that when we talk about inflation and we hear that the rate of inflation has dropped to something that doesn't seem crazy, we still have to remember that that doesn't mean that we are going to have deflation. So just because inflation is not continuing to rise at the same rate that it was, so so things aren't continuing to get more and more expensive as fast as they have been, the price of those same things is not going back down. Like we are going to arrive at a new normal and it is going to be a higher threshold of new than where we've been in the past. Is that accurate? It is accurate. Yeah. The, um, even though inflation now I think is what at 2.9 last time I looked at it, if I remember correctly, um, overall, uh, in the last three years, inflation has been at about 20 or 21%. So, that 20 or 21% aggregate over the three years is what's killing people because most of us have not had our um, compensation, our salaries increase <laughs> right. by 20 or 21%. Anybody, We've been lucky. Anybody out there getting those kinds of raises year over year? No. No. Yeah. no, Nobody is. So it's a nope. net squeeze on everybody in terms of what they have to prioritize in their spending, Right. And yeah. that's where that's where the rub comes in. Carol wants to know in Stillwater, why? Why is Minnesota becoming such an expensive place to insure a car? Mm -hmm. Do we know? Uh, Are there that many the... naughty drivers, like bad drivers? <laughs> Slick roads? <laughs> What's happening? Uh, actually, it was because in, in what, what the articles that I read said is during the pandemic, uh, people took more risky behavior and that uh, extended to their driving when they were driving in snow and rain and ice. And there was just a lot more accidents in Minnesota than in other states. Um, plus, add to that, um, that lawyers are getting involved more and more in settling uh, these accident claims uh, because they're very good at advertising on TV and uh, even so, so when, when lawyers get involved, the aggregate claim that an insurance company pays out is higher, but the amount that the individual actually gets is lower because the lawyers take more. And so, um, and then the third one uh, skipped my mind here for just a moment, but those two things for sure have oh, contributed I think it was to. Like, wasn't it something going. about as cars get technically safer for the individual in it? 
the impact of the damage to the vehicle in an accident ends up costing more to fix. Something about that. Yes. Like yes. something about the improvements that they're making to the vehicles, I mean, counterintuitively make them more expensive to insure because they're more expensive to fix. Well, yeah. safer vehicles are more complex vehicles. That's just the way life is. If I you want to make a vehicle that doesn't even safe, have a chip in it anymore. I don't even know where to get one, but I think that's what I want. I want, you know, I want one that's like actually made of metal and doesn't have a chip. <laughs> <laughs> Never going to happen. I'm going to get you an wanna, old tractor. <laughs> if you want a heavy vehicle, just go buy an electric uh, pickup <laughs> truck. Know. Those things are what, like two tons or something? I know, but I know this is, yeah. And this is, there's so many conversations that we could have because part of this is like the cost of gas or the cost of electricity or how far you live and how often you'd have to recharge something, da, 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 da. So yeah, um, well, <clears throat> clearly you and I could continue talking about this for a long time, but how about we take a very brief break and when we come back, we talk about, I mean, a really exhilarating topic. How about the national debt and what the national yeah. debt is actually costing us? Could we talk about that? Yes, we can. All right. During the break, I am going to figure out how many zeros are required to um, actually write out the number related to the national debt. So how many zeros are there in a trillion? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. 150 million people, 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live, any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night. Download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. All right. How many zeros are there in a trillion and how many trillions now are there in the U.S. national debt? Bill English is here with us. Bill, do you have the answers to these questions? I, don't, I didn't count the zeros. I, Paul, I was hoping here was you Paul Perot's Paul Perot's contribution to the conversation. There are as many O's in a trillion as there are O's in a bowl of SpaghettiOs. <laughs> or well, Cheerios, kind right? of. <laughs> no, or Cheerios. There you go. <laughs> Cheerios. That would have been mm. yeah. That that would have crossed all kinds of borders. Okay. So um, the national debt. W what is it? How much is it? And. Um, what is it costing us? Because it's really, again, it's the carrying cost. It's not whether or not I can ac accumulate debt. It's whether or not I can pay for the, um, yeah, oh. pay pay for the carrying yeah. cost. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, national debt is right at thirty five trillion. It's a little bit over that now, and um, uh, the deficit is how much we add to the debt. So the debt is the accumulation of all the deficits on an annual basis. So annually we run we're running about 1.7 to 2 trillion dollar deficits and then that deficit is added to the national debt. That that's that's one way to look at it. The national debt is at about 35 trillion if you take out the amounts that we owe ourselves like intragovernmental agency debt and stuff like that. I still think the national debt last time I looked was at 27, 28 trillion. Um could be a little bit off there, but not by much. Uh, the ten, the uh, the interest, just interest that we are paying on the debt, the Peterson uh, Foundation projects will be eight hundred ninety-two billion dollars this year, and in uh, let me look here for twenty-five. Yeah, for twenty twenty-five next year, uh, it'll be one point zero one trillion dollars in interest that we will be paying. And if you go out to uh, 10 years from now, 2033, we'll be paying $1.6 trillion a year just in interest. And so mm. this is clearly unsustainable. Uh, you know, one side of the aisle is going to say we're spending too much. The other side of the aisle is going to say we're not taxing the rich and corporations enough. I think it's somewhere in the middle, personally. 
Um, as a turnaround guy, if somebody handed me this problem, I would raise taxes and cut raw spending and at least get us to a break even. But there's not any will in Congress uh, to compromise to that extent. So um, this is this solution we could fix. You know, we could fix this problem with a decent solution. I don't think there's the will in Congress to do it. So it will be forced on us by economic realities at some point in the future. And that will be a very, very difficult time um, for this country when that happens. Our very faithful friends are um, are texting in that a trillion has 12 zeros. They are posting it in numerical form on the text line. And so thank you all so very much for those contributions to the conversation. Joseph in Minnesota, who typed it all out for me, I really, I totally appreciate <laughs> that. It's a lot of zeros. Um, yeah. We don't have any political party that's uh, that's seeking the next uh, opportunity to serve as president of the United States. We don't have anybody who's like, this is my main concern. I want to bring down the national debt. I want to cut the... I want to cut spending. Like, nobody is saying that. But the Harris-Walls plan would actually add something like $1.7 to the national debt. So that seems bad. Well, yeah, and and that's that's really the disappointing part, isn't it? You yeah. know, you have at the Republican National Convention, the debt was rarely mentioned. At the yeah. DNC this week, it's not being mentioned at all. The the end of, the only real independent candidate that we have at a national level isn't really talking about this, and yet this, in my mind, is the number one issue. It, this is like a cancer, uh, an economic cancer that's growing in our society. We all know it's there. It's the elephant in the room, and nobody wants to talk about it. Um, to me, uh, both parties are letting the country down by talking about what their constituents want rather than what we need to talk about. And uh, I think that's that's a shame that both parties are letting us down. Yeah, and everybody text again is like, we need to be focused on um, the essentials. We need to be talking about um, preparing for hard times. We need to be talking about, you know, how we can support one another when things get um, increasingly difficult. And you and I have talked about that in the past, that part of the responsibility of Christians is to have enough um, margin in our own in our own resources that um, when times get very difficult for our neighbors, we're in a position to help. And so, thank yeah. you as always yeah. for um, the way that you you encourage us in those ways. Maybe maybe repeat that encouragement, which I know you've given us in the past, but maybe um, encourage us in that direction today. Yeah, you know what? When not if these realities come home to roost, it's going to be very, very painful. And if the church is well positioned economically by being out of debt, by people having some level of savings, uh, the opportunities to reach the lost for Jesus Christ will be um, immense. They will be very available. They, uh, To use another word, they will be pregnant. They will. It, it, it will just be um, very not easy, but it will be very apparent that the lost needs Jesus. I think the opportunities for the church to witness and to minister to the lost during an economic downturn are going to be substantial if God's people live differently today in terms of how they manage money so that they are not caught up as much in the swirl as the rest of this world will be caught up. So we, this is all, Carmen, you and I both know, this is all about Jesus Christ. Life is all about God. This whole thing we're doing on this earth is about bringing glory to God and enjoying his presence and inviting others to do the same. To the extent that we are bound by, ch by the chains of desires and economic difficulties, we can't minister to other people. Let's become free, people who are free from the bondage of sin, who are living simply and cleanly economically so that we can bring others to Jesus Christ. That's, that's kind of how I'd look at it this morning. Uh, one listener wants to know, if Bill becomes the president, will he still come and talk with us on Carmen's show? Uh, yes. 
because yeah, Carmen is my like best should... media friend. I feel like you should make that <laughs> commitment now, Bill. All right. Hey, brother, we do appreciate you so much. We know you're busy, um, and we know that uh, God is using you in so many ways. Um, and so thank you for dedicating this time to a conversation with us. Really appreciate it. You're welcome, and thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. That's Bill English. You can connect directly with him at BibleAndBusiness.com. He's on all the socials, but if you just go directly to the website, check out the blog, see what he's talking about. You can actually read the opening chapters of um, of his books there and get a sense of maybe which one you want to uh, dig into more deeply. So again, BibleAndBusiness.com. Um, dating these days. I mean, you know, I'm married, so I'm not dating. And even back in the days when I was dating, I wasn't really dating much. I am the person who had a lot of first dates <clears throat> and um, and almost no second dates. Um, dating, though, is the way that we, you know, ultimately arrive at a, a relationship that's going to endure. So in a conversation about uh, young people who are struggling with identity and struggling to know where they fit and don't even know necessarily what the purpose of marriage is, what are the practices of dating? Who is dating whom and how might we encourage emerging generations, college students in particular, um, on this conversation about God's design for them and their um, and their life? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Marriage and divorce are in the headlines um, over and over again, and who's getting married and who's getting divorced and who's dating whom. Dating has really changed. People are swiping right and swiping left. I don't even exactly know what that means, but it's happening out there. So what does God have to say about dating and marriage and how we uh, build a life together? Cana Vox, think about the wedding at Cana. Cana Vox, giving that a voice, uh, is an organization that I love. I appreciate the resources that they produce. And April Redliner is here today, again, from Cana Vox to talk with us about reaching college students with God's design for human sexuality. April, welcome back. Hi, Carmen. Thanks for having me back again. Yeah, let's talk about dating. First of all, are people dating? Is dating really happening? Well, you know, dating is happening. Um, and what we're trying to do at Canavox is really help bring it back, right? Because, well, a couple of things, right? We're trying to bring back sort of a, a healthier a dating script that maybe that's going on right now. Um, we, we started this session on dating um, just initially for our younger audiences, right? To get them back thinking about it, thinking about a healthier way since all the, the dating norms that they, uh, you know, young adults experienced 25 years ago, you know, they're not common. And um, we wanted the young people today to, you know, start with a new dating script that would really help them um, date in a better way. So we started this dating session and um, we had it for the younger audiences, but then we decided to put it in our syllabus for parents as well, because we thought um, they're not, the, the parents may not be aware of what's going on in dating these days. And also um, it could help them understand the situations and also help them when they're guiding young people and helping them contribute to this like healthier dating, you know, way of dating. So Canavox, when people go to canavox.com or they want to engage um, in this material with a group in a conversation, it could right. be that they're going to watch a video together. It could be that they're going to read something. And the the that material then becomes the basis of the conversation. Kind of remind us how a Canavox uh, group works. Yeah, so usually people get together, um, they do the readings or watch the videos in advance. Sometimes they can do, you know, reading, read paragraphs together, but also sometimes they can view some of the, the video clips that we have and then talk about it in their group. But basically they get together and they have conversations about um, the particular topic for each session. And this one in dating has some really great videos. Uh, there's a little clip from a movie called The Dating Project. Um, and I don't know if you're able to see that, but um, there is a full length film and I think you can still get it on uh, stream it on Amazon but it really is excellent it was done by a professor at Boston College who was um, constantly approached by students in her sort of like mentoring capacity 
um, about like them. They wanted to date. They wanted to meet people, but they didn't know how to do it. All they were used to was the hookup culture. And they were expressing an interest. And she was like, you know, I'm talking to all these students about this. Maybe I should do a class. So she offered a class, which I think is still being offered in like a different form at Boston College. Um, but that's what this this film, The Dating Project, is about. They talk about her and the class and how um, that worked. And then also it it um, tracks the lives of, of four different people in different stages in their life as they're dating. Um, but really, it's so interesting. The class she she gives the students in the class a dating assignment and she gives them some rules of dating and she talks about the different levels of dating which um you know i think you know young people these days um don't necessarily the the casual dating which is so important in getting to know people and, and getting to know yourself and what you want to look for possibly in a future spouse um is not so common these days right this ca this idea of casual dating you either um you know, fall into the trap of, uh, you know, the hookup culture, or, um, you know, they end up going into just serious dating right away, instead of going into this area of more casual dating. But anyway, this movie that we have on our syllabus is really a great way to be able to see all that in play. So the dating project, for those of you who are want to check it out, the dating project movie.com actually has um, all kinds of resources related to this as well. Um, yeah. When when you think about uh, even some of the language that you're using might be foreign to some people listening. So when you talk about the hookup culture, yeah. what is that? And when when you talk about casual dating, um, what like what is that? Like I'm because I think if we don't have a shared language, then we might have a hard time uh, being sure that we're really communicating with each other. Right, and that's so and that's so important. Um, Carmen. So what we do at, in Canavox, we've highlighted five area, or five levels of dating, right? We have this on our dating roadmap, and this is also on our website. And I the love the dating roadmap, by the way. It's really good. <laughs> I don't even know okay. that people ever thought about having a dating roadmap before, so it's good. All right. Well, you know, I think we didn't, but now we have to because I think it's the the you know the dating script that from the past that we had is so foreign to young people that we kind of had to just like say, all right, let's spell it out and put it out there for them to see. So we start out with, um, we, we have five stages, right? We have initial attraction, casual dating, exclusive dating, serious dating, and engagement. Um, and this initial attraction is like the one that we're all probably familiar with, right? So when you meet somebody and you have butterflies in your stomach, you know, you're, you're really, um, you know, uh, physically sort of attracted to the person, um, you know, physically and kind of, you know, mentally, right? Because you like this person. Um, and during this stage, you know, we all know that it's, it's hard to make objective ju judgments. Um, so this is like, you know, that initial, that initial stage, the second stage, um, where we have casual dating, and this is the one that we kind of talked about. Um, it's really a laid back, non-exclusive type of dating with one person who you're open to forming a romantic relationship. It's supposed to be low risk. Like I said, no strings attached, kind of get to know people, um, and, and know what you want in a spouse, right? Um, you keep it light take it slow and um, you want to make sure it doesn't feel like it's rushed and it moves at a comfortable pace. Um, this is really like a, to look at it, this, this type, this stage of dating, right? Um, you want to, if it's going on, if it's going well and if it's at a healthy pace, it's like you still enjoy yourselves outside of the relationship with that person, right? You have hobbies, you have your friend groups, your family, and you're both, um, there's minimal conflict. So it's very easy breezy. And on uh, the initial stage, you're, it's not exclusive. So this is important. And this is something that that um, most dating relationships these days don't kind of go into this casual dating. And it's something that we're really trying to bring back. Um, the third. I think, the, the, well, I also sorry. think of no, I also think of casual dating as like intermittent. Like I'm not this is not something where this person is involved in all of the same things that I'm involved in. We don't do things like we're not seen as a couple. Um, it's not as if you you aren't still fully. Um, I think that the, maybe that gets to that like hobbies and interest and friend groups and those kinds of things. This other person isn't integrated into all of that. I sort of Absolutely. have this like intermittent relationship with this other individual. And Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
hundred percent on good. that. And it's, and it's, and it's that way for a reason. And, and it's, again, you're learning about yourself and you're learning about, um, you know, you know, your interests and maybe are, are you compatible? Um, and then, so to ask your question, you, you asked about the hookup culture. The hookup culture is that's like, you know, speeding past all of the other things and going right to, um, you know, engaging in behavior that we save for marriage, right? Hooking up sexual activity, um, you know, and that, that just, that just ruins, I mean, that just ruins everything because you're supposed to be growing with people, right? Contrary to popular opinion, like it's not the physical intimacy, but the emotional and the intellectual intimacy that are really like the stuff of great relationships, right? Physical intimacy is really a cheap substitute for all of that. Um, and also physical, that physical involvement, when you jump right into that, it can blind you to major red flags in a relationship. Um, and it's exactly what you don't want when you, you don't want that. You don't want that. Yeah. So, Andrew, Andrew is asking if um, if this conversation applies to people who are older or just people who are, you know, in college or in their 20s or in that age group. And my answer is, I think I think all of these conversations are for everybody. The difference is maybe that I mean, because everybody needs a roadmap. But the difference maybe is yeah. that at different ages and stages, our expectations of what might be on the road ahead together are different. Yeah. I, absolutely. I think that's it's for everybody. And I also think um, what's on the road ahead and also like maybe the timeline, how it happens. Sometimes, you know, if you're talking about dating, we're talking about in seventh and eighth grade, it's much different, like what the purposes are for it, you know, um, mm. and it's it'll be stretched out like in seventh and eighth grade. If you're you're dating someone, it's a different type of dating, right? It's good friendships. Um, Can't even no hardly school. like apply like that, that word. Like I'm like that that word seems wrong for seventh and eighth grade, but I'm well, following. right. Well, we don't, right. Well, we don't, we, we have, the, we have them on our dating strategic plan. If you look at that, just so that we actually, we want them to start the idea of thinking about it and not really doing it. It's, it's called, mm. it's called friendships because really at the heart of dating is good friendships. I mean, we, we actually define dating, right? It's a ritual of friendship with the opposite sex that's open to forming a ro romantic attachment. And we mm. do want, we do want seventh and eighth graders to be thinking about that uh, in a road ahead. And that's sort of what I was getting at. Um, you know, if you're if you're thinking about that when seventh eighth grade, it's much different than when you're thinking about it when you're 23. When you're 23, hopefully you're thinking about, you know, I want to start dating somebody seriously. I'm thinking about marriage and family if that's what you're called for. You know, um, yeah, so I think maybe really the you're more spread out. You know, as you you're talking about it with younger ages. Um, but friendship friendship is key across this whole thing, right? And we we like to highlight that as well in in um, Canabax Okay, so, when we come back from a very brief break, we're going to continue our conversation with April Redliner. I know you guys want to know where these resources are, um, uh, you know, where, where you can get them. So canavox.com, C-A-N-A-V-O-X, Cana, like the wedding at Cana, Vox, like voice, canavox.com, trying to give a voice to to marriage as God designed it um, in a culture that's really, really confused about these things. And our conversation today is about Dating. The resources at canavox.com related to dating have all been updated. And so we thought it'd be a good opportunity for us to talk about um, these today. And yes, we are also going to talk about, you know, like how to break up and keep your dignity. But we're going to work our way through the uh, through the rest of the list on the dating roadmap. That's next here on Mornings with Carmen. Hey, is Faith Radio on your prayer list? Prayer is a powerful tool that God invites us to use as we live as his people in a world that often ignores or even denies him. At Faith Radio, we believe in God's power accessed through the gift of prayer. Our fundraiser is right around the corner. Would you pray for us that God would move in the hearts of listeners, that God would provide and accomplish what only he can do? We can't do this without the in-gathering and sharing of the resources that God has placed under the management of listeners just like you. So thank you for praying for us and the upcoming fall fundraiser for Faith Radio that God would provide and reveal more of himself to us, that his love and grace might continue to flow through this ministry. Are you dating? Do you wish you were dating? Are you dating and you wish you weren't dating? We're having all kinds of dating conversations today. Do you have a roadmap for dating? If you're single and you're a Christian, how are you going to go uh, about meeting another person who is a Christian? Maybe these are conversations that you're having with young people in your home. I know we're having these conversations in my house. 
Um, so we're talking with April Redliner. The ministry is Canavox. You can find it at canavox.com. We'll send you all the direct links if you want to text us, 877-933-2484. All right, April, you were walking us down the uh, dating roadmap. Um, where, where are we? So after casual dating, which is the second stage of dating, we move on to the third stage, which is dating exclusively. Um, and this is where you make a more formalized commitment to deepen that relationship with that person that you were dating casually, right? You decide that, you know, you really like this person you, after like three months or so, you know, that's kind of the general time time frame for that casual dating. Um, you know, depending on what you're doing, it may take a little longer, but you realize you want to date this person exclusively. Um, and so you, it's really um, pursuing a deeper knowledge of the other person, right? Um and we have five things that we say you should focus on when you're doing like exclusive dating. For one, the first one is compatibility. How compatible are you, right? This is your opportunity. This is time to figure out what your differences are. And if you can work through those differences, you know, sometimes opposite attracts, but sometimes that only goes so far. So that's an opportunity to work on your compatibility or just, you know, determine whether you're compatible. Uh, you also can focus on relationship skills communication, conflict, conflict resolution. These are the two most important. Um, this is an opportunity for you to share your feelings uh, and really get to, to, to know one another. Um, also, you get to look at relationship patterns, right? Um, how, do, how does this person behave with different people in different contexts? How are they with the people when they're, you know, getting served at a restaurant? How do they act at a big party? Sometimes people are extroverts, introverts. How does that work? Um, these are this is a really good opportunity to be able to to see that during this phase of dating um, family patterns and their background. Are your family backgrounds compatible? You know, sometimes they are. Sometimes they aren't. There's negative patterns that people have in their families. There's positive ones, too. We also have to see, you know, this is the opportunity for you to see those things. And if you can work through them or if maybe they're, you know, just non-negotiable. Um, character and conscious traits. Right. This is really the most probably important. Um, what's their belief system? What's their character? You know, this is this is this is a big deal um, when you're thinking about dating someone. You know, you're dating someone exclusively, and you're thinking about serious dating, right? Moving forward, um, and this is the opportunity where you can watch out for these red flags. Um, you look at these five things I just talked about, and you can see, um, you know, if there are any red flags that you need to realize, and then say maybe this is going to work or it's not going to work. All right, let's say. Um, a red flag uh, is waving brilliantly. Um, yeah. How do we break up? That's a good, good question. And, um, you know, with the rise of people using lots of technology and things, we see people breaking up not so well sometimes. Um, but we actually have a couple of articles that we put on there specifically for that to help young people and for parents to like counsel the young people and how to break up how to keep your dignity. Um, and we have one that's specifically geared towards women and we have one that's geared towards men. But I think um, the one thing that we always say is breaking up with someone, no matter what stage of dating you're in, has to be done in person and you have to be kind. Um, and it has really um, a lot more with what you do afterwards than what you do while you're ending it. And, um, you know, we want to treat all people with dignity and respect. And even though it may be hard at the time, we we the person who's doing the breaking up has to has to um, be gracious, right, and not chatty and not gossip. And you know, don't one of the key things too is don't make improbable promises. Like I think lots of people when they're trying to end it try to really end it easily and say, oh well, you know. Let's just be we'll friends. still be friends. We'll still exactly. do stuff. No, mm -mm. We'll still no do it's stuff. like, no, yeah. Or true. maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll work. You know, I, mm -hmm. I might see your year when I'm not so busy or something. Don't do that. Don't make those false promises, you know, because that just that's leading someone on and trying to, you know, you just have to end it and do it. And, and I think when they do it the right way, everyone is happier. Why it, it may be hard at first. Everyone will be happier. So we're talking um, with April Redliner. We're talking uh, about resources that are posted at canavox.com. Uh, we are talking about dating. And specifically, we're talking about, um, you know, helping to equip our college-age students with uh, with God's design for 
um, for relationships, but it's applicable across the board in every direction. All right, so we have arrived um, at number four on the list. Let's say that uh, we have moved from casual dating to dating exclusively. We have, through this pursuit of a deeper knowledge of the other person, neither one of us has come across any red flags, so the relationship is progressing. What's next? We probably uh, better talk about these pretty quickly. Yeah, so we have serious dating. Um, and many experts that we consult say serious dating requires like one to two years before engagement, but there's lots of, it, it just depends on the people, right? It really depends. Uh, but this is a, this is the time where you can take more time to really get to know each other even deeper than in the last one. You still have to consider those five areas we just covered, but now you're becoming more involved in each other's lives. This is where like you highlighted Carmen, like from the very beginning, you know, the casual dating is not like being involved in all people's friends groups. This is where you are focused. You're going to create relationships with each other's extended family and friends. You're going to become more involved in each other's long-term career plan, plans, social commitments, all those things. Um, but you're also going to be, be mindful to respect physical boundaries, right? Because when we cross that line into that area, the sexual part only clouds your judgment and it diminishes your chances of a successful future, right? You've got to keep your mind clear about what you're looking for. Um, yep. And then, and then we'll we're going to get engaged. And then, and then we get engaged. Yeah. yeah. But, and you can look at all of these things on our roadmap. We have them all in more detail for people to like kind of look at and think about, which is very important, right? Thinking about all these things and have it in your mind as you're doing it and before you're doing it. It's so good. It's so helpful. We um, we're so appreciative of the conversation today and um, and the ministry that you're engaged in at Cana Vox. Again, that's April Redliner. Um, we're happy to send you the resources over the text line. Just text us 877-933-2484. You can find it all at Cana Vox. C A N A V O X dot com. We are um, we're just almost completely out of time today. Uh, And so I want to encourage you again to listen carefully to the words that are being used in the culture um, and to ask people what they mean when they use a term. Not everybody is operating with the same definitions out there. So when you hear somebody use the word freedom, what do they mean? When you hear somebody say, we're all God's children, huh, what do they mean? Is that true? When you hear somebody talking about marriage, um, what do they mean by that? When you hear somebody talking about um, dating, What do they mean by that? These are opportunities for you and I to be curious and humble, to enter into the conversations of the day in ways that honor Jesus. And so I want to encourage you as you get out there into the world that God so loves, make the name of Jesus famous. Worry more about uh, Jesus's reputation than your own. Yes, speak the truth, but do so in love. Um, Carry yourself with the dignity of an ambassador of the King and the Kingdom. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. I know you only get to spend it once and it's very valuable. And so thank you um, for choosing to spend it with me. Have a great day and God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBerge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, Click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.